Praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. We thank God for another opportunity to be here with you on the air tonight. My name is Pastor Gregory White, and I am the pastor and under-shepherd of the Lord House of Prayer for all people. We are located at 9318 Southwestern Avenue, and that is in Los Angeles, California. That zip code nine zero zero four seven you can reach us by phone if you would like to contact us at phone number four two four two zero three nine six five one we thank you for tuning in with us tonight on the broadcast and we pray that something will be said tonight to draw you closer to christ and help your walk with the lord now we honor tonight Dr. Thomas Blackwell, for allowing us this opportunity to speak to you tonight here at the KTYM Broadcasting Station in Inglewood, California. We thank and praise God for him. And also, as usual, we give our Holy Ghost shout out to our friend and our brother, uh, Pastor Charles Ashley of the Perfect Peace Bible Church in Los Angeles. That address is 11151-53 South Broadway in Los Angeles, and that zip code is 90061. We believe that God is doing great and mighty things in your life, and we thank and praise God for what he is doing, what he has done, and what he is going to do in your life. Amen. Thank God for the privilege of speaking to you and sharing his word with you on tonight. And God bless your hearts. Uh, let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us this time to come together in the studio on the airwaves to share your precious holy word with your people. Thank you for those tuning in and those listening we ask that you would touch the airways, touch our voice. May the Holy Spirit take our words and use them to enlighten the people of God for the closer walk with thee. Forgive us of our sin. The Bible says we all have sin and come short of your glory. Bless us now as we journey to look at a portion of your word. We thank you and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, our place of study tonight is going to come out of uh, the gospel recorded by St. Matthew, and we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 16, and we'll be reading in your hearing verses 13 through 18. Again, that is the gospel recorded by St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, and it reads as thus. When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we want to talk just for a little while tonight about the church built on a rock. Church built on a rock. I found out that even though Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And even though he rose with all power in his hand of heaven and earth, 
his church is still not have not reached perfection. By saying the church, we're not talking about a building because most people, when you say church, we think a building or a place, a physical place of worship. But but we're talking about the church. We're talking about a people, a royal priesthood, a holy generation of people, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, consecrated people of God. I found that found out that some have made the confession with their mouth, but even though they have confessed, they still have not consecrated or separated themselves. Some have confessed publicly with their mouth, the Lord Jesus, as the Bible tells us to do. But in most cases, it was only propaganda. You know propaganda. You know what propaganda is. It's what the politicians use to get elected. Most times it's information that is misleading. Some are in the building. <clears throat> they come to the church. They're in the building, but they're not really on board. Some are come, they're in the place, but they're not necessarily in the plan of God. We have often said or heard it said that the church <clears throat> is the redeemed of God. Those who have been baptized and have made a profession accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But many times, in spite of their profession, these same individuals sometimes, even though they have professed, they have the propensity or the proclivity to procrastinate. Procrastinate what? In their living. Living what? They procrastinate in living out their proclamation due to their procrastination. Why? Because of problems which prohibit them from pressing forward on to the mark, the high calling of Jesus Christ. This calling, this calling, this calling, is not a low calling. It's not a regular calling. It's not a meager calling. It's, it's not the same call as mama calling you, saying dinner is ready. It's not the same calling as your significant other calling you, or hitting you on your cell phone, or on Facebook or FaceTime. It's not that type of call. But this is a calling from Almighty God to the church. It is a high calling, one that has called us to be separated from the world. Called to do what? Stand up, put on the whole armor of God, and to fight the good fight of faith in these last and evil days, fighting that fight and knowing that our faith in Christ will not fail because he has, is faithful that has promised and because our faith is founded upon a rock. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, we have to be careful not to misinterpret the scripture in this particular Bible verse. Some will say, Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Some might say that he's building the church on Peter. And I know a lot of us has heard that or have heard that said before. But the church could not be built on Peter. Because Peter lied. Peter denied Christ three times. Peter took his sword and cut off the servant's ear. But even though Peter did all those things, Peter turned right around and preached after Pentecost, and over 3,000 souls were saved. You can find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. But in Rome, the church in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica Vatican, the church in Rome, the Vatican, was actually, they built it on top of the grave of Peter. So they physically built the church on, on top of Peter. This was around the 16th, 17th century. They built this particular church in Rome on Peter's grave. The New Testament 
New Testament was originally written in the Greek form, originally, which the Latin English and other versions were translated from that version. If you study the Greek text, you will find out in the Greek text that the word Peter and the word rock on which Christ was to build his church are two separate words, each having two different meanings. Jesus says, I say unto thee, Peter. The word here that Jesus used, Peter, here in the Greek is Petros. In the Greek it means, this word Petros that Jesus used means a piece of stone. It means a single stone, movable, insecure, shifting or rolling. But the church of Jesus Christ, the church built on the rock is Petra. When he talked about Peter, he used Petros. But in the Greek, this term is Petra, which means a huge rock, a massive rock, a cliff, the mother of all rocks, if you would, a huge mass, a solid foundation fixed on eternity, immovable, enduring from everlasting to everlasting. The language that Christ actually spoke was not Greek, but the language that Jesus actually spoke was Aramaic. The word he used here for Peter was Cephas. Jesus named, called him Peter. The Greek language uses gender-specific nouns in the Greek. When the Greek New Testament was written, the author used the word Petros because it was the reason he used that because that word was the male version of a rock. And it would have been insulting to refer to a man by female terminology. When Christ referred to Peter in the text, he uses Petros. He was making reference to how Peter was insecure and how Peter would later falter in his faith. This is the reference when Peter saw Jesus on the water and he asked to come to Jesus. He got out of the boat. He began to walk on the water, but Peter began to sink while Jesus walked continually on the water. Also knowing beforehand, Jesus knew that Peter would deny him and say he didn't know him three times. But Jesus states that he would build his church on Petra, an immovable force. This being, what he built the church on was not Peter, but he built the church on the revelation, the revealed revelation of his word of who he was, the Christ, the son of the living God. And this information did not come from man, but Jesus said this information comes from the Father in heaven. In Matthew's gospel, this being the first, Matthew now is the first of the synoptic gospels. What do you mean synoptic? So-called because they see together the life and the teaching of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record basically the same events when you look at them in comparison in the text. But they give different accounts and they give different emphasis. Sometimes people say the Bible is confusing or the Bible uh, is is doesn't state the same thing all the time. It's not clear in its clarity of the word, but it actually is. When you look at the Bible, said, well, the word I'm looking for is contradict. They say the Bible contradicts itself, but it does not. You have to study it in context. When you study it, you have to study who it was written to. You have to study the time it was written and who the author was talking to. Because in one sense, Jesus could have been talking to the Jews Another sense, he could have been talking to the Gentiles. So we always have to look at the context of what Scripture was written. Matthew, in his gospel, presents Jesus as the king of the Jews, the long-awaited Messiah. At an early date, this particular gospel, it received, Matthew received the title, Katamathion. What does that mean? That means, according to Matthew, 
In our text today, we see a dialogue between Peter and Christ regarding his divinity. Peter's original name, originally his name was Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah in the text. He was known to be, Peter was very impetuous. He was very harsh. He was very outspoken. He was loud, arrogant, confident, and conceited. Y'all know anybody like that? Probably so. So if that be the case, and Peter was all these things, then why would Jesus call him to be a disciple and to be a follower? He's arrogant. He's loud. He's overambitious. He's self-confident. He's conceited. He's rowdy. Why? Well, for the same reasons he picks you and I to be disciples. He wants to take away those ungodly qualities that we possess, our failures, our faults, our foul-ups. And he wants to transform us, as he did Peter, into the church that is built on a rock. You know, as, as we look, we say, well, Peter denied him, and I never would, and Peter cursed. And, but we actually can learn something from Peter, because even though he possessed Peter possessed many of these negative qualities like us. He still, Peter still possessed a willingness to repent. When he denied Jesus, he went and he wept bitterly and he cried and he repented. And we never see where he denied Christ again. So Peter repented and changed. And doing so, Jesus used him mightily to build his church on the solid rock. As we look at our text today, we want to look at, and if you have your Bible, we want to look at verse 13. We want to make a couple of points uh, as we move forward. Verse 13 says, When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Now, these, he's asking, he's going to receive some different opinions on who the people say that he was. In asking, he was not really concerned about the scribes or the Pharisees because he knew they was haters and he knew that they were out to get him. So he wasn't really concerned because they were, thought they were all that the religious leaders had their nose up in the air. They're better than everybody else. So his concern, when he says, who do men say that I am, he was pretty much concerned about the everyday people or those people who were following him, who he had fed and who he had healed, and the people in a general sense. He was saying, what are the people saying about me? And who are the people saying that I am? Now, he knew that they did, hadn't really grasped the concept that he was the son of God. Uh, so you notice in the text, he says, who do the people say that I, the son of man, am? He, he makes a statement that he is the son of man, which he was 100% man, 100% God. And in one, in one place he said, if you don't believe me, believe me for the very works. Because he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he did all these miracles, and he was the personification of the church. Because when he came, he was preaching repent. John was preaching repent. He preached, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is near you. So he was representation of that kingdom. Now when you say the kingdom of heaven, sometimes the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, we may say, well, the kingdom of God is where God is in heaven. And we say, may say, well, the kingdom of heaven is where God is in heaven. But depending on the context of the text that the word is used, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God can be used interchangeably, but not necessarily meaning the same thing. But the Bible, Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven, and it talks about uh, the reign of God, the rule of God, the kingdom of heaven, reign of God, and the rule of God, and the realm of God. And that kingdom that he said is near us, that kingdom is actually inside of us. Kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So when we are born again, and when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, 
and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, then that kingdom or that kingdom or way, there is a king that has a kingdom, God's way of doing, God's way of living, God's way of acting, God's way of talking. That is kingdom. And the kingdom is within you. If you accepted Jesus Christ, the kingdom is within you. Amen. So he was asking his disciples about the different opinions that he was concerned. Who are the people? What's the what are the people saying? Who are they saying that I am? Are they saying I'm the Son of God? Are they saying I'm the Savior? Are they saying I'm just a man? Or what is the, what are the people saying about me? And the reason I say that is because a lot of times we say, I don't care what people say about me. Yeah, we say it. We say it. I don't care. They say what they want to say. It don't make me no difference. But as a child of God, it does matter what people say about you. Jesus was the son of God. He was the Savior, the Messiah. And he was asking the disciples. He could have said, I don't care what, the, what they say. And he could have very well said it. I don't care because I'm the son of God. They can believe or they cannot believe and they're going to be damned. And it wouldn't have made a difference either way. But he was concerned about what the opinion of of the people that were following him, he was feeding, he was healing. So he asked the disciples, what, uh, what is the populace, what is their opinion? Taking a census poll. What's going on? What are the people saying? Different opinions concerning Christ. He asked, whom do men, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? What are they saying? And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and some Jeremiah and one of the prophets. So they their response was some of the people are saying that you John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was supposed to come back from the dead after he was Herod beheaded him. And so they said, maybe this is John the Baptist who came back from the dead. That's what the people were saying. Probably because also he was preaching repentance. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias. All right, that word Elias means Elijah. Because they probably thought he was Elijah because Elijah did great miracles. He was one of the greatest miracle workers in the Old Testament. Elijah was. So some of the people would say, okay, he's doing miracles. Then he probably is Elijah that came back from the dead. Some people say, he said, some say you're Jeremiah. Or that word is meaning Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And they probably attach that to him because Jesus was weeping over the condition of Israel and of his people, and he was very compassionate, and at times he would weep. over. He was sad over the condition of the people because he wanted them to be saved, and the people were uh, going against what, what he wanted, which was to save them, as people do today, and he, would, he was sad. Sometimes he would weep. So they were saying, maybe he's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. So we see... Peter's great profession. So the first point we want to make is when they ask who the men say that I am, the first point is the church built on the rock is founder. It's founder. Jesus Christ is the founder. The people who were not sure who he was in our perfection, and we ask, are they sure who we are? Are they sure who we are? We say one thing and do something else. So he was concerned, so we should be concerned. So the first point is the church built on the rock is founder. Jesus Christ was the founder. King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, the long-awaited Messiah. He was the founder, but the people still didn't know, did not know who he was. So the first point is founder. Jesus said in St. John 10, 30 through 38, we're going to turn over there real quick, and we're going to look at that. St. John 10 and 30 says, I and my Father are one. He's the founder. He's one with God. He says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, but which of those works do you stone me? So the founder is Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and he the reason they wanted to stone him a lot of times and kill him because he would say, I and my Father are one. When you see me, you see the Father. He was telling the people that he was God in the flesh, 
and that was blasphemy. So the people were saying, you can't say that because you're saying you're God. So the people wanted to kill him. Jesus was saying, that, well, if you don't believe me, then believe me for the works. Believe me because I raised the dead. Believe me because I healed the sick. Believe me because I opened blinded eyes. So he was the representation of the church. He was building the church on himself. He was the founder of the church. Verse 37 said, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. So the founder, he was the founder. He came doing miracles and supernatural works, the miraculous. He said, if I don't do the work, don't believe me. Can we say that? Because if we are uh, the church founded on the rock, if we are the church is a people, it's not a place. It's we are the church, those who are saved and blood-bought and washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are the church. And we are still, and the church is still, is, is have already been established, but we are, Jesus was the, uh, the main concept of the church. He is the rock. And we are living stones. We are lively stones. Talking about the church built on the rock. He is the solid rock. I stand on Jesus Christ. All other ground and sink is sand. So he is the main stone, and we are the lively stone. We are building. The Bible says no other foundation can someone build on other than the foundation that has been laid by Jesus Christ. He is the Bible says. He is the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. He is the head, the chief stone that the builders rejected. So he is the head, and we are, he is the, the head, and we are the members, the body. Amen. Of the church. So he was saying, if I don't do the works, then don't believe me. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that I am in the Father. And the Father in me. His, his miracles testify. We're talking about the church built on the rock. So he came building the church with miracles and works. And the, he's saying, let my miracles testify of who I am. You don't have to believe me, but the works that I do to speak for me. The miracles testify. Christ's works and his divinity. He was one with the Father. Because of the works that he did, he said, believe me for those works. So we look at the founder. The first point is its founder. Jesus Christ was the founder of the church. And then he goes on to say, but he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? The inescapable question. That's the question that God is going to ask those that, didn't, that don't accept Christ. God's going to ask them, who was my son to you? What did you do with the knowledge of my son, Jesus Christ? Did you accept it? Who is he to you? See, he was leading, he was going somewhere by asking them about the people. And it's easy for us to make judgment calls on people. Oh, they ain't about nothing. They this, they that. And sometimes it's good. We do have to call a spade a spade. We have to call sin, sin. But he was asking them to see what the general consensus of the people was because he wanted to then turn the focus on them. You've been with me. You've actually seen all the miracles that I've done. You've been following me. Okay, now who do you say that I am? That's the inescapable question, my brothers and sisters, that we all have to answer. Who is he to you? He said, well, I believe he's the Lord. You do? Yeah, I believe he's the son of God. You do? Yeah, I do. So if we do, then we, we have to begin to become transformed and not conforming to the world. Not going to be sinless, but we ought to sin less. Man, some of the stuff, uh, we telling God to stop us, Lord, help me not to do this. He said, no, you stop doing it because you have the power in you, because you have the Holy Spirit. You have the ability. See, so... We're praying to the Lord, people, places, and things. That's what I say. People. We are the church built on the rock. So if I'm the church, I'm not supposed to be. I'm not saying you not, can't go around people that are not saved. But when we go around those people, we ought to win them to Christ. With our lifestyle, with our attitude, with our talk, 
with our walk because we are the church built on a rock. So he said, what do, what do you say? That's what they say. Okay, now what you say about me? So we can always say with somebody else, but when it comes down to the rubber meet the road, what do we say about Christ and who do we say he is? And the way we answer it is by the way we live. We're building on the foundation that Jesus laid. The way we build on it is we build on it with our lifestyle. Because people say a lot of things, but and that's okay. And I give a person the benefit of the doubt of what they say. But after you say it, then I'm going to watch and see what you do. That's the same thing with me. If I say something, then you need to watch and see what my actions are going to be. So he, he asked us today an inescapable question. Who do you say that he is? How do you answer it? Not verbally, but your faith and your works. Until I have faith, James said, some say they have faith, but they don't have works. He says, show me your faith without your works, show me, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So the way we answer it is in our walk. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say he is today? How are you answering the question? It's inescapable. We can't get around it, and we can't escape it. Because not only are people watching, God is watching us. And you don't, and we don't have to worry about people. We just need to worry about God is watching us. And that will help us get some act right. Amen? Not going to be perfect and sinless, but we need to strive toward perfection. Amen? So, here we see, we talked about its founder, and then Jesus asked, what were the people saying? And then he goes on to ask them, what do you say? So then we see Peter answers the inescapable question. He asked them. Peter was the first one to blurt out. Remember we said Peter was loud. Peter was arrogant. Peter was conceited. Peter was self-centered. He would just later on be the spokesperson, be the leader of the disciples. And Peter, was he was the first one to jump out in front. He's going to say something, even if it ain't right, he's going to say it. He ain't going to hold his tongue. But in this particular part of the scripture, Peter answered the question, and Peter, of all people, Peter got it right. So if Peter is all those things, and he got it right, surely, you probably not as bad as Peter. If he can get it right, you can get it right. Why? Because we are the church built on a rock. Church has already been established. So we are just building on the foundation that Jesus laid. So then he says, and then and Peter confessing Christ. We see Peter's great confession of his divinity and his uh, being the Messiah. In verse 16, it says, And Simon Peter answered Jesus, and he said, What? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter got it right. He knew who the founder was. The founder, what? The founder is Christ, the son of the living God. See, there were a lot of other gods. There were a lot of gods at that time. Asterisk and fertility God and the God of the sky and the earth God and the God of the crops. There were a lot of different gods. But Peter distinguished and differentiates that Jesus is the Christ. That word Christ means anointed one. He is the anointed one that has been sent. The anointed one and his anointing. Peter got it right. He said, you're the anointed one. You're the one that we've been waiting for, the long-awaited Messiah. You're him, the one that brings salvation. The name Jesus means God saves. God saves his people, what? Through, G through Jesus Christ. The Lord God saves. We'll say Jesus saves. He saves. So Peter said, you are, in other words, Peter was saying, you are the Savior. You are the Christ. You are the chosen one. You are the promised one. You are the one we've been waiting for. Thou art the Christ. And then see first, Jesus says, who do people say, I, the Son of Man, am? Peter turns around and says, not the Son of Man, but Peter says, you are the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. See, a lot of those other gods were dead gods. 
that were not alive. But Peter says, you are the son of the living God. So here we have its founder. Our second point, it says, is in verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Here we see Jesus' divinity is acknowledged through Peter through a revelation from God. It is spiritual discernment, discerned from the Spirit of God. And then uh, it says, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal it. You didn't learn it from a man, but this revelation came straight from the throne room of God. He said, Simon Peter, he says, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. Now, Jesus called him Peter, but his name was Simon bar Jonah, or son of Jonah. So Jesus says, you are blessed. Why? Because of the revelation of the word of God that you have. The reason we're blessed is because of what we know about the Lord Jesus Christ and what we know about God. Our blessings come through revelation because our revelation open our eyes. They open up doors. So Peter was blessed because God gave him a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. Blessed art thou, and we are blessed. And see, a lot of times we say, God is doing a new thing. You know, God's, God is going to do a new thing. And I believe God is doing a new thing. But I don't believe he's doing a new thing as a sense of making something old new. Because his word says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he changed not. So if he's not changing and the word is not changing, then what is he doing new? They're doing something new. Well, I believe that what he's doing new, he's given us a new revelation of the same word that we already have. Because the word of God uh, can be learned in depth, deeper in depth. That's like if you're digging, uh, when you study the word of God, you're digging into it. You're studying it, not just reading it. You have different books, different resources to dig into. And that's what the church is supposed to do. It's built on the rock, but we are supposed to continue the laboring in the building. But the way we do that is we have to get in the Word of God, study the Word of God, and know what the Word of God says. Just like if someone is digging, you're in the backyard, you get a shovel and you're digging, you may find a piece of metal. Keep digging. No, I found a penny. And keep digging. Oh, I found a piece of silver. Dying. Keep digging. Oh, I found another piece of silver. If you keep digging deep enough, deep, 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 well, I found some. This is a piece of gold, uh, as in Africa. And they dig, they go over there, they dig, dig. Oh, I found some platinum. I dig deep, deep enough, I found some titanium. So the Bible is in, in, in depth. You can, do, you can go as deep as you want to go. It's always revealing itself and always peeling off layers as we dig and as we search in the Word of God. And that's what we are supposed to do as the church, built on the rock. We're building on spiritual revelation. Because he says, Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. Why? Why was he blessed? Because he was able to receive a revelation of who Jesus was. The revelation, he was blessed because of what was revealed to him from God. The church is blessed because of our revelation of who Christ is. And then once we get that revelation, then we can build on that solid rock. Because the rock is the foundation in the text, the revelation of who Jesus Christ was. He asked the people, said, about John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah. <clears throat> but then Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he says, since you, now since you have that revelation, now you're blessed. You're blessed because of what God has revealed to you. And the reason you're going to be blessed is because when we take heed to what God has revealed to us in and through his word. 
That's how our lives change. That's how our lives turn around because of the word of God. When we uh, study the word of God and we get in the word of God and we listen to the word of God preached and taught, and then because we can listen, how many times have you heard this preached? How many times have you heard it talked about? Okay, now today we find out he didn't build a church on Peter, Petros, which was a stone, an uh, insecure, movable piece of rock, but he built the church on Petra, which was like Gibraltar, the huge rock, a cliff, a mountain, on the word of God. It's built on Revelation Church. He said, you bless Peter, you got it. That's the whole revelation of the church. Of the church is Jesus Christ. That he is the son of the living God. That's the foundation of the church. And if anybody is not teaching that, then you don't want to be part of that church. Because that's a cult. If anybody is teaching anything other than this revelation that Peter got, he was blessed. Why? Because he understood that nobody else knew. Everybody else was guessing. No, and and no, Jesus says, no man can come to me except my father draw him. No man can get revelation about Jesus except God through the Holy Spirit give it to you. See, now in this in, the, in this text, we're in Matthew, so the Holy Spirit had not been given yet. So Peter got direct revelation from God. Now our revelation to us is going to come through the Spirit of God, through the Holy Spirit. While Jesus was here, he gave revelation from God because he was the mediator and the go-between God and man. So the revelation of God and from God came through Jesus Christ. Peter, Jesus was still here, and Peter got revelation directly from God. Now, when Jesus left in St. John, he said, I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He said, I'm going to leave. And I'm going to send the comforter back. He said, I'm going to send another comforter. That word another in the Greek context means another of the same kind. So what is he saying? I'm going to leave from being with you. And I'm going to come back and be in you. So Jesus left. And when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ that have come back to dwell and abide in us. And when you study your Bible, you'll find that to be true. So, we see its founder, and then we see its foundation. The foundation of the church is the foundation is built on Jesus Christ. The foundation of the church is built on the revelation that Jesus is the son of the living God. That's the rock that the church is built on. God's revelation of his son. So Peter found out and Peter spoke uh, the foundation. And that's what we build on. We, if we build on any other, anything other than that, then we're not building on the right foundation. So if a person wants to build a skyscraper, they don't build on the same, they don't tear the building down and build on the same old foundation. If they want to build any type of building that they expect to stand, earthquake and whatever the case may be, they tear the building down and they tear the foundation up all the way flat. Then they set it up with the wood and everything. Then they pour a cement foundation. Because then once you have a good foundation, you can build a skyscraper. You can build twin towers. But the foundation has to be right. So we see its founder. Now we see the church built on the rock. We see its foundation. It's founded on Jesus. Because he is the head of the church. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And so the foundation was is the revelation. The foundation has to be what's revealed from God. It can't be that I read the Bible and come up with my own revelation. Yeah. It has to be what God has revealed because that's what's going to stand the test of time, the church built on the rock. 
is going to stand. So, so first we see the founder. Now we look at its foundations. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Spiritual discernment. Then, in the next verse, he says, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. That's that Petros again. Petros. Thou art a stone. Like if you go in a quarry where there's a bunch of rocks. You got big rocks. You got little rocks. You got stone. Peter was a stone. He said, I say unto thee, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Petra. It seems as though in this terminology that he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It seems as though he's saying he's building it on Peter. But if you look at it, he's saying, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That rock. The revelation of the word from God of who he was. Upon this rock, what's going to happen? I will build my church. He's the foundation. He's the founder. It's built on him, on Jesus Christ. But not just on him, but the word revealed from God of who he was. Son of the living God. The rock. Revelation that Peter received. That he discerned spiritually. I, it says, I will build my church. It's not always say, not my church. A lot of pastors say, my church, not your church. My deacons, not your deacons. My choir, not your choir. Not your money. People, not yours. None of that. It all belongs to God. Because if it's yours, then that means you're going to hang around forever. And if yours, if the church, if I say it's my church, then that means I should have some nail prints in my hand. If I say it's my church, I ought to have a print like Thomas. When Jesus came, came through the walls and the disciples were sitting there tearing and they saw him, Philip was not, Thomas was not there. He came, Thomas, you missed it. You missed Jesus. Came back from the dead. He came in and he spoke to us. Thomas said, I don't believe it. No, he said, I don't believe that. He said, the only way I'll, they called him Doubting Thomas. He said, the only way that I'll believe it, he have to come back and show me himself. He said, I need to see the nail prints in his hand. I need to stick my finger in his side where they thrust the spear. Other than that, I won't believe. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And so he says, I'm going to come back just for Thomas. Make a special appearance. And that's what he does for you. He'll do, he'll do something just for you. To help your faith. Jesus comes back. Shows up. And he's talking. He says, Thomas, look at my hands. Look, stick your finger, thrust your, the very thing he said, I need to see the nail prints, I want to touch it, and I want to stick my finger, thrust my finger in the side. Jesus shows up and tells him the very thing that he says, if he don't see it, he's not going to believe it. Jesus showed up, says, my, the nail prints, touch them. Here's my, when well, they thrust me in the side, stick your finger in it. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. But it was, it was his church. And we are members of his body. He is the head. And it's built on the rock. It's going to stand. People people say, I hear people say, church is failing God. Church is failing God. How can it fail God? How can God's church fail? Church is not failing God. Everybody that's in the pulpit she shouldn't be up there. And everybody in the pews are not saved. So you can't make a judgment call based on the church, based on people that may or may not be saved. People say the church is failing God. church is not failing God. church is right where God knew she would be. See, we have to understand 
that the church is built on the rock and founded on Jesus Christ. So it can't fail. Church is going to be the future bride of Christ. So now the church is still in the getting ready stage. She's getting ready. And just like a bride, when she gets ready to get married, she put her makeup on and she put the dress on and she get it tailored and get it fitted. Church is in the getting ready stage. The church is not failing. God. Because the church of Jesus Christ is built on a rock. It's built on the revelation of God's word of who he is. So we see founder, see the foundation built on the rock. And then when he says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we see the founder, see the foundation. And in verse 18, we see the church's future. Jesus Christ is the founder. The foundation is built upon the revelation of who he is, God's word. He is the son of God. And the future of the church that Jesus Christ will build is building, has set the foundation and laid the foundation and built. He said, I will build my church and gates of hell shall not prevail against it because it's going to stand because of its spiritual foundation. Because it is the founder, foundation, and its future is that it will stand and the gates of hell will not prevail. The devil cannot win against the church. Because Jesus said, it's in red, I didn't say it. Jesus said he can't win. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not. That has two meanings to it when you look at it. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's that mean? That mean of all hell, all the demons and all the devils come against the church, it's not going to prevail. It's not going to Because it's, how can it? It's God's church. He the one kicked the devil out of heaven, remember? If he had power to prevail, he would have stayed up there. But he couldn't. God kicked him out. So that has two meanings. One, everything encompassed in hell cannot prevail against the Lord Jesus Christ's church. Two, when when someone goes to battle, they don't take their gates out with them, do they? No, they don't go into battle and say, okay, y'all, bring the gates. Come on and bring the, the gates out. The gates of hell will not prevail. So not so much, yes, in a sense, he's saying everything that is in hell will not prevail against the church. But on the other flip side, he's saying the gates of hell shall not prevail, meaning what? So the hell is gated. All those people that are in hell, that place, wherever it is, is saying that when the church gets it right, and we get with one accord, and we get on the move, on the onslaught against hell, <clears throat> the gates of hell will not be able to keep the church out. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church's onslaught, which means what? You can go on intercessory prayer. You can pray. You can reach, reach in there and get your cousin. <clears throat> the gates of hell can't keep you out. It won't prevail against the church. You can go in there, maybe your mama ain't saved, your daddy, your cousin, your daughter, they acting a fool. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the onslaught of the church. So not only will hell not prevail against coming against the church, but hell cannot prevail against the church's onslaught coming against them. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That's good stuff, my brothers and sisters. So you are more than a conqueror. You are more than victorious. You are the church of Jesus Christ built on a rock, built on a solid foundation. Amen. So we pray. We talked about its founder, Jesus Christ. We talked about its foundation. 
Then we talked about his future. If you're listening to me today, and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is your day. And before the foundation of the world, God knew this moment in time would come. And he's making salvation available to you today. You've never asked him in your heart, in your life. I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you right now. I've never asked Jesus to save me. And I know that if I die without him, I'm doomed to everlasting damnation. And since I never did it, I'm a sinner. And I'm need, in need of being saved. But I know you love me, for you sent your only begotten Son, that whosoever believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's me. I want to have everlasting life when I leave here to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. I believe, Father, that Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that he came into this world, born of a virgin. I b repeat this after me. I believe that he lived, he healed the sick and raised the dead. I believe that they crucified him, nailed him to an old rugged cross with all of my sins. I believe that he gave up his life and died just for me, that I might live. I believe they put him in a borrowed tomb, and I believe early Sunday morning he got up with all power of heaven and earth. And I believe that he's coming back just for me. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, we believe that you just got saved. Go tell somebody that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then pray that God will lead you to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where you can get in his word and learn about being a, a disciple. And our doors are always open. The Lord House of Prayer for All People, 9318 Southwestern in Los Angeles, 90047. I'm Pastor Gregory White. We welcome you to come be a part of what we're doing and thank you for tuning in, and we praise God and pray that something is said that will say that will help you. Before we close, uh, we would like to ask you to help us to keep uh, the word going forth on the air on KTYM. If God touches your heart, we would like for you to send a donation. You can download the Venmo Cash app, V E N M O. You can download it on your phone, and you can send a donation to Gregory. Dash white dash eighty six, Amen. Venmo, Gregory dash white dash eighty six. We pray that you will send us a donation to help us keep the word of God going around the world via KTYM. God bless you. Uh, we love you. Thank you for tuning in again. We thank Dr. Blackwell for this with this time with you together, and we love you. We're praying for you. And we pray God's choice blessing upon you and your family. And as we always say, the best is yet to come. I believe that for you and your family. Amen. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Amen. For all things are possible with God, nothing is impossible. Remember, his church built on the rock. Its founder, its foundation, and its future. You are the future of the church. Amen. So we bless God for you. We thank God for you on tonight. I believe that is our time. And until next time, we're going to ask you to pray for us. We're going to continue to pray for you. Send us an offering. Amen. Pray about it. And send us an offering. Venmo Cash App. Download it on your phone. Gregory Dash White Dash 86. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Until next time. themselves and pray he said if my people who are called